Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to another interview on the Art of Intervention Project Summit. Today we get to hear from Tiffany Jenkins who has really taken her story and just created just a, a movement impacting people and empowering people, I'm just going to say around the world. So she is hilarious. I love, I've become a huge fan of yours since I've come across you. Uh, but Tiffany, where, where are you coming from today and uh, how would you kind of describe yourself? Hello, thank you for having me, first of all. I'm super stoked to be a part of this. Um, I am Tiffany, I'm from Sarasota, Florida, and I'm a wife and a mom and an author, and I make weird videos on the internet um, to try to use humor to bring awareness to subjects that people feel weird talking about. I showed my kids one of your videos recently, it was one about anxiety, and I loved that one. It was just, it's really funny. So, so you bring a lot of levity to this world of addiction, which is real painful and hard to navigate and people are just stuck, which is why we're doing the summit to, to just bring some, um, I guess I'll just say it again, levity to, to this, this crazy world that we're in right now too. So how would you describe kind of like what you do right now to reach people with this positive message? And then we'll get into your story and just kind of hear how you've come to where you are today. Okay. I, I found that people tend to listen for longer when you're not lecturing or talking at them. I like to make videos that have a hidden message kind of. So they'll start off using humor and people are like, oh, this lady is hilarious. And then at the end, you know, I'll drop the bomb. I'm also an addict. And they're like, wait a minute, this isn't what I envision an addict looking like. This, you know, she's smiling, she's laughing, she has a family. How could this be? And so I'm kind of shattering their idea of, you know, all addicts are lost causes or they'll never amount to anything. And I, I find great joy in doing that. People have really, I'm amazed at the response that I've gotten. I never expected it to happen this way, but I'm so grateful. Yeah. Again, what a cool platform to reach people on social media and everything you do. Uh, so I got sober 19 years ago. And nice. I was remembering, yeah, it was, yesterday was actually my birthday and uh -huh. uh, it's substance. And it's crazy because when you, when you would hear people's stories and meetings and stuff, that's how I got sober. You'd look at them and go like, there's no way you're that person that you're talking about. And yeah. you probably get the same response to yourself. Yeah. I, so I actually wrote a book, not trying to be a promoting Patty, but in my book, I detail a bunch of like really horrific things that I did. And I get so many emails from people like, there's no way this is real. <laughs> and it's such a big compliment because for so long, I thought that's what I was. That was the person that I was. I was a monster. And um, it's not true. I just got lost along the way. And so I'm trying to reach those people who are lost or people who think um, that they've lost all hope for their loved one, you know, to keep hope alive. Yeah. I'll, I'll be your promoting Patty. Is that what you said? Um, the, uh, <laughs> your book's called high achiever, right? Thank and, you. and, yeah. and obviously your readers enjoy what you do because you have almost like 4,000 reviews on Amazon, which that says a lot about how you're changing people's lives. So I think everyone, everyone has a story in them and they need to get it out. And so, you know, pushing your story out there, I think is, is a great way, is definitely a great way to do that. And so we know you're again, social media, everything, but, but somehow you got to this point in your life where your story was not one you probably wanted to share a lot of. So can you kind of walk us through not only your journey, but the journey your family went through having to deal with you in that process of your life? Yeah, that time in my life, I, well, I spent my life my early life just feeling weird feeling out of place feeling crazy and so when alcohol was introduced to me my senior year um it was the first time that i felt numb i didn't feel um lost anymore and so it was like i always had that tendency in me to become addicted but it wasn't until i fed it that things got out of hand and it progressed so quickly and alcohol turned to weed and turned into opiates. And opiates were ultimately my downfall. I spent 10 years addicted. And every day I'd say, you know, well, at least I'm not snorting them. And then I, you know, eventually I would. Well, at least I'm not an IV drug user. And then I would, like there was no low that I wouldn't eventually stoop to. And I became a person that I didn't recognize anymore. I thought that getting into a relationship with a sheriff's deputy would be enough to keep me 
clean. I thought his love um, and structure would be good for me. I had a grown up in a house with a police officer, so I remembered the structure that my childhood had. Um, but addiction's really strong and doesn't care, you know, who you're dating. And so I ended up hiding my drug addiction from him for many years. Uh, every day I would wake up and I would put a mask on. I would pretend like I was this upstanding citizen. And, you know, meanwhile, I'm robbing people and lying and doing things, you know, in the dark that I would never admit until now. Um, and eventually my lies caught up with me, <clears throat> excuse me. And I was arrested with around 20 felonies. Wow, you hit, you swung for the fences on that one with with twenty felonies. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, why not? If you're gonna go, go, man. <laughs> well, <laughs> what well, what was it like for you living this double life internally in your brain and the emotions you had to deal with with that? Every day I wanted to die. Every day I prayed for an overdose. Um, every day I convinced myself that this was the last day that I was going to get high and that tomorrow I would get clean. Um, every day was spent wearing a mask. I had to make up lies and I had to pre-plan lies for a lie that I was going to tell later on in that day. Um, it was exhausting. My mind was going a million miles a minute. I was chained to my drug dealer's house. Like I couldn't go out of town. I couldn't go to a family function. I couldn't do a load of laundry if I wasn't high. And I always compare it to I felt like I was the tin man and the drugs were my oil. And if I didn't have them, I would just freeze up and cease to exist. And I needed them to keep me going. But I did. I, I prayed for death. And truthfully, the only reason I didn't end my life on my own was because I didn't want like a huge mess for my loving partner to have to clean up. Um, I didn't want to traumatize him, but I did. There was a point where you know, I would envision crashing my car. I would, it was so dark. And I thought I was born by mistake. Um, I was meant to live this short life and fizzle out that, um, you know, something went wrong and I was never supposed to be here. And I didn't think I could ever live without drugs. Um, and so with that desperation and hopelessness, you know, comes a drop in morals and a drop in values. And I was doing things that I never in a million years thought that I would do. And I was just waiting. I was waiting to die or waiting to get in trouble and getting in trouble happened first. Thank goodness. Right. I mean, there's so many avenues in our journey that could have stopped us. And that was the one that, that got you, but that part you're talking about the, the dying part that oh, suicide ideation, you know, I mm -hmm. dealt with a lot of that before I, attempted suicide before I had gotten clean as well. But, but those moments when you see yourself die, no one knows the depths of that except for you. And yeah. so you have these family members who are looking in on you, right. And like watching you, like who, who were important people in your life at that time? Um, besides um, your sheriff, your sheriff, your boyfriend, uh, but what mm -hmm. was going on with mom and dad or relatives or anything like that? My mom had just passed away. Um, when I started dating him, my father was also struggling with his own things at that time. So he was kind of in and out. Um, and my sister who I have a mostly love relationship with, but when I was using, she had nothing to offer me. Um, so I only reached out to her when I needed something, when I needed money or something. And so we would get in lots of fights. She would accuse me of doing drugs, drugs, and I would get defensive and say really mean things and distance myself from her. And so I was pretty much alone. Um, it was him and his family that I was consumed with. Um, his family, his parents were like um, Christians, wonderful and amazing human beings. Like I always say that if there was a line of people who deserved what I did, they would be the very last people in that line. They were incredible. So he, everybody always says, well, he's a cop, you know, how did he not know? And truthfully, I think, A, I was an expert manipulator and liar. You kind of have to be when you're living in your addiction. And B, I think that when you love somebody, <clears throat> you tend to oversee red flags and ignore warning signs because you want so desperately for it not to be true. Yeah, and I, 
was super strategic. Like he would work 12 hour shifts. So, you know, there was this 12 hours of the day. He had no clue what I was doing. And that made it easier. Yeah. Professional manipulators. Like you live this life of yet that you said, you mentioned yet earlier, this hadn't happened yet, but then you did this and, and that's the, that's the progression of an addiction. And so, so there's our, our addiction life. And then this, this intervention happened, this forceful intervention. Um, I'm sure that was a hard day for you and a, and a hard day for him just being in, in his line of work. So what did that process look like from when you were arrested with, you know, 20 felonies at the time to the next year or so, or whenever you had to deal with that? Um, it was the, it was the worst time in my life getting arrested by people who I knew who I'd been friends with, who I'd been to parties with, who thought I was this one person and I wasn't, um, being in jail and withdrawing from drugs, you know, while the whole town slowly figured out the truth of the monster that I was, it was too much to bear. I tried to end my life in jail and they caught me and took me to suicide watch. And, um, I detox from drugs in a glass cell. Um, and I was blind because they took my glasses, so I couldn't hurt myself with them. And I just remember feeling like I am not a human. I am, I am less than a human. I am less than an animal. I am just, you know, this being that's um, flipping around on the floor in pain that people are just watching. Um, and then my dad ended up visiting me on Christmas told me he had cancer and told me that he himself had gotten clean and sober and that I needed to get my life together so that we could do the recovery thing together as a family. <laughs> and that inspired me to make the decision to go to rehab. Wow. Yeah. I got goosebumps on that one. That's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. My dad um, loved me when I was at my lowest, when I didn't deserve love when I didn't love myself and he had like this faith that I could do it even though I hadn't had faith in myself. And so for the first time, somebody wasn't calling me a junkie, loser, liar, felon. Somebody was calling me their daughter. Um, like they saw the real me and I needed that. I needed to know that I was worthy of a life. And so um, me and him ended up uh, going to meetings together he would come and visit me at rehab. I gave, I got my one year medallion and I turned around and presented him with his and we got that on video. It's pretty neat. Um, and, uh, he, he got to meet my son and, you know, we built an amazing sober relationship together in the short amount of time that we had together before he passed away. And I would gladly take that small chunk of time over the lifetime of whatever it was that we had had before for the first time we were able to spend uh time together sober and it was it was amazing wow and your son got to watch that how old was he at that time so my son actually was five months old when my father passed away i wow. ended up going to a halfway house after rehab and that was where i met this handsome hunk who lived in another halfway house and uh, he ended up getting me pregnant in the halfway house. And um, we worked really hard and got an apartment together. And my son was born on my birthday of all the days he could have popped out. He picked my birthday. And, um, and yeah, he, my dad got to meet him. And then when my son was six months old, I found just after my dad passed away, I found out I was pregnant again with my daughter. What a bunch of great miracles and recovery. Recovery is pretty amazing, right? When, I mean, yeah. all these things just start happening. Like, wow, look at this. If, if I would have been that, I couldn't have enjoyed this. And now here you are. And so what year was this that you found recovery? 2012, the end. All right. 2012. All right. The end of 2012. Yeah. So November 26, 2012 is my clean date. And so I'm at like seven and a half years. Um, which is crazy because I couldn't go seven minutes without drugs before. Like, I, I can't believe it. And, um, you know, every day that passes, more cool stuff happens. And it's like so many amazing things have happened from the last time I used. I remember when I was in jail wanting to die. And I, I think if I, 
I could have tried my hardest to envision what my life would look like and it wouldn't have even come close to what it is. Mm -hmm. Like I had no way of knowing back then how incredible things were going to get. And that's why I always tell people, if it feels like it's the end, trust me, keep going because you have no clue the amazing blessings that are waiting for you. Yeah, it's like have you ever seen that that picture of the guy that's like underground, like you yes, know, with his yeah, and right he, if he took one more swing at the pick, it'd be like there's that beautiful diamond, diamond. but you quit. Yep. Before the miracle happened, and exactly. so w- what can people do to speak to people that are like in recovery or or they're afraid of recovery and it's like oh this can't be fun at all, but what what can people do to like have a good kind of recovery life? Uh, to have a good recovery life. I remember, <clears throat> sorry, there's horses in my throat. <laughs> I remember thinking, you know, I can't have fun while sober. You know, all they say to change your people, places, and things, but the only people that I know use are parties. So are you telling me that I can't ever talk to these people who've been such a big part of my life? Um, and I realized once I got clean, like what a true friend actually looked like. And it was nothing that I'd experienced before. People in recovery who I'd met at meetings uh, would come to my house and pick me up and take me out for coffee and talk to me and just expect nothing in return. And so once I learned the true value of friendship and the true value of myself, I didn't settle for less. Surrounding myself with people with the same goals as me and people who knew what it was like to have fun while clean was instrumental in me wanting to keep going. I had to laugh in early recovery and have like genuine fun in order to want to do it. And I met a group of great girls who I would belly laugh and laugh till tears streamed down my face. And I hadn't felt that in years since before I started using. It reminded me of my childhood and it was so good. It was such a good feeling. I had a sponsor um, and I was constantly working on myself doing steps, examining the things that led to me wanting to use. And that was when I discovered I had anxiety and depression and I didn't know that. And all those feelings, my whole life of feeling crazy and feeling out of place were this anxiety and depression, but there's no name for it. I never talked to anybody about it. So when I found the alcohol and the drugs, it numbed all those feelings. Um, And once I learned what it was, I was able to start working on it. Wow. What a, what a realization that you, you, that you can identify one of those things too. And so how did you kind of, we'll just say parlay that realization into how you bring again, humor into people's lives. When you talk about these moments and guys, you're like, wow, I can really do something with this. And it, I'm sure it probably just naturally happened for you, but what was that process look like to bring that to people, that gift? I um, was so my kids were 16 months apart. So Chloe was a newborn. Kaden was 16 months old. And my bonus daughter had come to live with us full time. She was like four at the time, I think. And I was really overwhelmed with motherhood and sobriety and marriage. And I went to social media to see like what people were doing. And nobody on social media looked like me. Uh, their houses did not look like mine and I felt like I was failing. And so I just, I started writing first about my experiences. I started writing openly and honestly about my messy house and my anxiety and my addiction and people really gravitated towards me. And I was shocked. Like the more embarrassed I was to share something, the more people reached out. And I was like, what is going on? Like, I'm not alone. This is crazy. And so then I started making videos too, because I always loved being in front of the camera and it just, it took off. And for the first time in my life, I realized I wasn't alone and I was being accepted for who I was, um, which is something I always tried to hide. And so, I mean, it took off overnight. Like at the time, I think that people were still, showing their highlight reel, showing all the perfect sides of their life, thinking that was what was important. You know, my house is clean, my hair looks nice, my family's smiling and perfect. Um, and, and I realized like the internet needed some realness. And I'm not saying like I kicked off the messy bun movement because I know that there were people there before me, but I have hopefully 
<clears throat> inspired people to show their true self and realize that the right people will stick around and the wrong people will fall off and it's okay to not be perfect. Yeah, people love vulnerability and I mean your promo video is really funny. I enjoyed that. It was just you've Oh, the, on YouTube? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one, you know, when you come out of the come out of the your room or something and you fall <laughs> down right, right after the <laughs> initial promo is it, 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 it was great too. And, but people Thanks. like vulnerability. I mean, you throw it out there and they're like, gosh, like you just said, you're not alone. Well, all these people watching what you're doing, they realize they're not alone. And in the, in the journey that we go through as people and suffering from addictions and recovery, there's this, this thing of shame that comes up sometimes. So did you ever experience any of that with your past and how did you overcome that with moving into who you are now? In the beginning, that, that was all I felt really was shame. Um, and it took me, honestly, it was the step work and the classes and working through that, getting to the root of it. It really helped to um, lay it all out there on the line and like in front of me in writing and be like, okay, this is what I did. These are the people that I can apologize to and make amends to. And once I started doing that and I started reaching out to people and admitting my fault in things, it really helped heal me. For so long, I blamed everybody else for my problems. And in one of the steps, my sponsor had me write all the people I blamed. And then across from that, write what my part in, was in it. And for the first time, I was like, oh my gosh, I've been so angry at all these people for so long, but it was all me. Like, this is what I could have done in this situation to make it better. This is what I could have avoided doing. And once I realized that I was the problem, it was um, very humbling and hard to deal with. Um, but I knew that I had to in order to move on. And so once I admitted my wrongs and tried to make amends, it really helped me alleviate that shame because now, you know, I can say I, I did everything I could to try to make it right. There's still a few people, a few really important people I have to make amends to, but it's not to the point yet where I feel like it will be beneficial to them. I still think it might hurt a little bit. So I'm holding off on that, but that is number one on my bucket list. And then I feel like my life will be complete. Mm. Yeah, that fourth column is a tough one sometimes. But when you start seeing it, you're like, what? Wow. Yeah. I, I, I was a big part of the – okay, okay, I am the problem. I was, but now I'm not and going forward and stuff like that too. Um, what are some encouraging messages you've heard from people that enjoy what you do in your videos and your comedy and sharing your stories that have inspired you to keep doing what you do? Because it's, it's tiring. I mean, when you do – so it's all that you do, it can be exhausting. But what, what kind of keeps you going? the just what you said the messages from people um i i'm sure everybody says it but i really truly feel like i have the greatest supporters in the world um my supporters are people who are open minded who are willing to accept people despite their past who are empathetic and understanding um with funny senses of humor and so it's like i have the greatest village right at my fingertips and so they're i mean my supporters have done things like they've all secretly gotten together and made little clips talking about how I've impacted their life and then put it all together in one 15 minute video about, and there's actually a video on YouTube of my reaction to it. My sister filmed me watching it and I'm just sobbing because it's like, what is going on? And um, they, their messages are just you know, I, I found you when I had one day clean and now I've got 249 days clean and you're a huge part of it. Um, stuff like that is like, well, dang, I was going to give up today, but I guess I'll keep going. <laughs> um, be, you know, and people always try to give me credit and I'm like, listen, all I, all I did was plant the seed. You're the one doing the work and people tend to try to put me up on a pedestal and I'm like, no, take me down. Take me down. I'm going to disappoint you. Trust me, please. There's no difference between you and me. And, um, and it's true. There isn't. There's no difference between me and that person in my inbox who feels like they can't get clean um, other than, you know, the willingness to do so. And once they get that, we're the same. Yeah, well, we got to stay in this together. I mean, I was watching your Facebook Live this morning before we got to do this. And I remember one of the, one of the ladies on there mentioned that she painted a rock for you. 
and she yeah. can't wait to give it to you someday. And, Liz. <laughs> and, and that, that was really cool. Just those, those little things, because no matter how long we've been clean or sober, you know, some people say clean and they're like, well, it was dirty. I'm like, well, get it. Semantics, whatever. We're not using drugs anymore. And our life yeah, is different. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I, I yeah. And it doesn't matter. Cause people that get hung up on that, they just get hung up on that. But. And I can but name a lot of things that were dirty. <laughs> yes. You but, could. We're getting ready to get into a, a skit here in a second. Just kidding. Um, but, <laughs> You know, it, it, I want people to hear this too. It's like, it doesn't matter how long you've been clean or sober, not using whatever, you know, it, it's all about what are you doing like today with it that really truly matters. Cause I mean, I've been sober 19 years, but near 11 of my own recovery, I had a major mental breakdown, which caused me to go away in a, in a fashion as yours, but I wasn't using drugs or alcohol. I had a bad gambling addiction that was still there. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, but I ended up, you know, having 19 of those pieces, not felonies that they came at me about. Yeah. And it was just like, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. So drugs or no drugs. We all got stuff. We try to deal with this, be mentally well. And humor is a huge part of that. And, and I wish more people were out there doing kind of what you do in a, in a, in a really clean way. I mean, you don't like some people think they got to do humor and it's got to be like crass and all this stuff. And you're just vulnerable and cool and real and down to earth. And, doing what you do because you know and, and people have gravitated towards that so uh what would you like to say to uh, just people watching it we, we have families watching right now that have a loved one suffering people are in their addiction and professionals that really honestly need a little pep in their <laughs> approach to helping people move forward um that's a lot of different people out there to connect to but what would you just say to yeah, no pressure. Like just, yeah no pressure at all like this is going to make or break the summit right now tiffany so um <laughs> So what would you say to them? Just inspire them to take some action in their life. Oh gosh. It's hard for me because to be honest with you, there are days where I can't get out of bed. There are days where I can't talk myself into cleaning the house. Like I, I, I don't ever want to even pretend to clean to have some magical thing that I say that can put pep in anybody's step. But what I will say um, is that it like, like you have professionals watching this. Is that what you said? Yeah. We have some people that you're trying to, you know, do better at what they do to help people. Um, so what you don't need no to speak to them, speak to, speak to just the families that have a loved one that's struggling, whoever you want to yeah. talk to. Okay, cool. Cause I, cause I, yeah, I have for, professionals forget the professionals. They're, they're not, they, they just, they just tuned out. Now we're just talking to the people that are in the throat. <laughs> <of it. laughs> um, if you have a loved one who's struggling, there's a, uh, uh, it's very, it's, it's hard to talk about because when love is involved, people, especially parents, you know, it, that's their baby. And so I can't imagine what it's like to have a kid who's addicted. I cannot. If my son was to get addicted, could I sit here and tell you that I would do everything right? I couldn't say that because I've never been in those shoes, but I've been the addict and I could tell you what worked and what didn't work for me. And what worked for me was sitting in the suicide tank and realizing nobody's coming to save me nobody's putting money on my books nobody's bailing me out of jail nobody is coming to save me it is up to me to save myself and there's such a fine line between loving and enabling and sometimes it could be the difference between life and death sadly and so the biggest thing that i would say to loved ones of addicts is please please get involved with some kind of resources for yourself. Like um, naranon.org is a great resource in my opinion, because it's specifically for the loved ones of the addicts. And it tells you, you know, what is suggested and what's not. Um, for example, you know, giving an addict money while well, it's, you know, as a parent, you're like, well, I don't want my kid to have to be out in the cold tonight, or I don't want my kid to not be able to have cigarettes. Well, you know, the only way that a person's going to overcome addiction, in my opinion, is if they become willing to do whatever it takes to not feel that pain anymore um, that comes with the lifestyle. But if they're not experiencing the consequences of their addiction and you're running around with a safety net before they hit their rock bottom, why the heck are they going to want to change? And if they don't want to, they're not going to become willing to do what it takes. And so it's so hard to sit there and tell a mom like, hey, don't give your kids rides. Don't give your kids money. Like, I don't want to be the one to say that, but I know, but what I would say is like, check your motives, 
if it's for you to not have to lay awake worried and that's why you're giving them money, then you're giving them money for you, not for them. You know what I mean? And I, it's, it sounds harsh, but my, um, there's nothing anybody could have said to me to make me want to change. Um, but it took me being really uncomfortable and not being um, enabled anymore to decide to make a change. So um, there's learn what to do and what not to do is really important. But most importantly, keep hope alive. There's no such thing as a lost cause. There's always hope for a life after addiction. Um, and please know that um, help is out there. And yeah, so if you're a professional watching this, you're doing a great job and thanks for everything that you're doing because I turn to professionals often for help with my own craziness. Um, but if, if you're a professional and you feel like what you're doing doesn't matter, just know um, that it makes a huge difference. I don't know what you're a professional in per se, but I will say that it takes people with a loving and empathetic heart um, to help make a difference in the world. And so it's one thing to just go to a job and preach, but it's another thing to genuinely care about somebody um, and become willing to help them. And so to all of you that do that, thank you. Yeah, and that's why I put together this summit was to give people these different just avenues, right? Of how to help a loved one, how to find tools, how to how to move into this this can be challenging direction, but a needed one too. So I appreciate all that you do. Thank how do you. people again I know you're all over social media and stuff, but what is like the best way for people to tap into all that you do to just see how they want to engage? Juggling the Jenkins dot com. It's probably the landing page for everything. I do um, a weekly parenting podcast and stuff. And there's blogs on my page, on my website from people who have overcome adversity, self-harm, addiction, domestic violence, things like that. Um, and there's videos, weird videos of me on there um, being a goofball and dressing up and doing skits. <laughs> well, I look forward to hopefully meeting you in person one of these days. Uh, yeah. Again, I'm a big fan and... Um, I just appreciate all that you're doing. So hope you have an amazing day today and um, just get to unplug a little bit and just, I don't know, enjoy the weather or something and just relax. So yes. Work. Thank you so much. And thanks for putting this summit together. I think it's great. I'm happy to be a part of it. Yeah. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Okay. Bye-bye.